You're listening to Medscape's in discussion series on chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, a podcast where thought leaders and clinical experts share their diverse insights and practical ideas for optimizing patient care. This series is hosted by Dr. Leah Witt. Dr. Witt is a geriatrician and pulmonologist at the University of California, San Francisco. At UCSF, she is also the Pulmonary Associate Chief for Ambulatory Affairs, a coach for the Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine Fellowship, and a passionate advocate for improving the care of older adults with chronic lung disease. Dr. Witt is an associate editor, producer, and sometimes co-host with The Curbsiders, a popular internal medicine podcast where she's covered topics on chronic lung disease, geriatrics, and gender equity. Relevant disclosures can be found by the episode show notes on Medscape.com or the Medscape app. The topics and discussions are planned, produced, and reviewed independently of advertisers. This podcast is intended only for U.S. healthcare professionals. Hello, I'm Dr. Leah Witt. Welcome to Season 1 of Medscape in Discussion, Chronic Obstructive Pulmonary Disease Podcast Series. Today, we're talking medications, especially inhalers and COPD, everything from correct use, cost, and tips for prescribing. I am beyond excited to welcome my friend and today's expert guest, Amber Lene Martirasov. Dr. Martirasov is an ambulatory care clinical pharmacist at Henry Ford Health and an associate clinical professor at Wayne State University. She describes herself as a huge advocate for patients. She practices in an outpatient clinic where she improves patient outcomes by focusing on getting patients the right inhaled medication at the right price. Welcome to the Medscape in Discussion podcast, Amber. Thanks for having me, Leah. It's great to be here. All right, Amber, we've talked a lot about this topic and we're going to get into it. But before we do, I wanted to kick off the episode by getting to know you. Well, I know you a little bit already, but for our listeners to get to know you. So what is on your mind outside of medicine, like a hobby, a book? If you have time to read books, anything on your mind. So I've been doing this new thing, what I call revenge reading, where I stay up too late reading books because I want to be able to read books. And I am currently reading The Wager, which is a really fascinating book about potential mutiny aboard a ship. It's a really good book. I would recommend reading it. I'm not done, so I don't know. No spoilers, but I'm enjoying it so far. How late are you staying up revenge? Um... Sometimes two, too late, two thirty in the morning. <laughs> oh no, that's yeah, pretty dangerous. I do not recommend to my friends listening to this podcast. I guess I'm revenge listening. I haven't gotten to reading because I fall asleep too fast. But I love podcasts, no surprise. And I started listening to Emily Oster's Parent Data podcast. I don't know if you read any of her books when you were expecting or after. Yeah, I'm not familiar with her, but now I want to read or look into her. She's amazing. She's an economist who dives into the data about pregnancy and parenting. And like, should we really worry about eating sushi when we're pregnant? Or is it not a big deal? Or will going to daycare cause irreparable harm? And the answer is no, which is good because my kids are in daycare. So she has a podcast and I was just listening to the episode where she interviewed Eve Rodsky, who wrote Fair Play today. So highly, highly recommend. And it, she takes such a scientific approach that I think anybody who's in medicine could really appreciate that approach. I'm going to definitely check her out. That sounds fascinating. Okay, so let's get into our case. I'm going to keep our patient the same as last episode, and we're going to talk about Mr. Rivera. Today, we're talking about medications, especially inhalers. So he is, just a reminder, he's a 78-year-old man. We diagnosed him with COPD last episode. He was hospitalized with a COPD exacerbation. So you're seeing him for the first time in your pulmonary clinic to talk about medications. He was discharged from the hospital with a teotropium soft mist inhaler and albuterol. There was a meds to bed sort of initiative. So he got the medications, but he doesn't know how to use them. I want to start by asking you, how do you approach that first post-hospital follow-up visit? Yeah, I think this is a really important question to consider, especially from a provider perspective. One of the things that we see commonly with inhalers is that patients will get these inhalers and either the provider doesn't educate them or believes that the patient will be educated when they get to the pharmacy and then there's a missed opportunity for education. So we're often seeing these patients say, I don't know how to use these devices. I think one of the things that's also really important to understand with this patient specifically is that teotropium soft mist inhaler actually requires the patient to put it together. It's not packaged in a box that's ready to go. The patient has to do some work there. And so 
when I first have these patients, I think the first question that's always important to ask is, what inhalers have you used in the past? And can you tell me about how you use them? If they have not used inhalers, then the next question I would say is, what do you think you should be doing so that we can try to start with what knowledge they have and then build upon that? And then kind of systematically going through the different steps of how to appropriately use the different types of inhalers, which we're going to get into, I am sure, because we talk about this all the time, it's our passion. So kind of going into those nuanced details of what is the breath like? When should they be holding their breath? When should they be blowing out their nose and things like that? We are so passionate. We have a secret love of both inhaler technique and Medicare Part D. So we'll get into that in a second. But I wanted to talk about the new gold guidelines, the holy grail of COPD management, which now recommends for group E, that's the high exacerbation group that he's in because he was hospitalized for an exacerbation. That group is recommended to start a lava llama, same as group B, which is the high symptoms and moderate number of exacerbation. Why do you think that is? Why do the gold guidelines suggest going right for the Laba Lama initially? I love this. So this totally taps into the pharmacist brain and we're going to talk about pharmacology. So when you think about the way that Labas work and the way that Lamas work, they are both bronchodilators by nature, but they are targeting different receptors. The Lama also has an added benefit of targeting muscarinic receptors, which then would cause a little bit of anticholinergic effects. What happens when we combine a LABA with a LAMA is we actually get this phenomenon known as dual bronchodilation with the added bonus of a little bit of that anti-muscarinic effect. And so this is fantastic for your patients with COPD who we know are going to have some limitations in their breathing and need that bronchodilator to open up those airways, but also because we know that in COPD, these patients are oftentimes going to have a lot of mucus. So now not only are we opening up those airways, but then we are getting an anti-muscarinic in there that's going to help to dry up some of that mucus so that the patient either is able to clear it themselves or the body will naturally take care of the rest. He left the hospital with just a llama, just a long-acting muscarinic agent. Would you switch him right away or would you wait and see how he does? So I would ask a couple of more questions, but my short answer is yes, I think we need to switch him because that's what's actually going to benefit this patient more. And given the fact that he's already had an exacerbation that led to a hospitalization, we are trying to do everything we can to prevent future exacerbations because that means future worsening of the overall lung function. So yes, short answer is we want to switch him. But before we do, I want to make sure that one, he was able to even afford the teatropium he got on the first round. And then I would actually like to assess his ability to use the inhalers before I decide which of the combination therapies I want to switch him to. I think that's so important that we just think, oh, well, we'll just switch him, pick the one that's similar. But if your patient couldn't use the first device to begin with, you're actually setting them up for failure because they're not going to be able to use the new device that you give them, even though you're giving them the correct drug therapy. Okay, this is the perfect setup. So what are some of the device delivery options? And then how would you assess what to give him? Yeah, great question. We always have to think about really three different types of devices, and then we kind of throw nebulizers in on the back end. So our historical albuterols have always been what we call a metered dose inhaler or an MDI. Then we have our dry powdered inhalers. Many people are going to think of like the Advair or the flutigazone cell metarol discus. And then we have the newer class, which is actually what this patient was prescribed, that soft mist inhaler often referred to as an SMI. Now, I want to make a quick note. I said three, but within the MDI category, the QVAR Ready Haler, and it's the only one of its type, that inhaler is actually what we call a breath-actuated inhaler. So it operates just like a metered dose inhaler, but instead of the patient having to depress a canister, the canister will naturally depress as the patient inhales. So it's breath-actuating that depression so that it administers it. It is the only device like that, so it technically falls under a metered dose, but just want to make sure our audience is aware of those differences. One of the things that's really important when we think about these different devices is the breath technique. And it's funny, I actually this morning was having a conversation with one of our RTs, a respiratory therapist who's been a respiratory therapist for 40 years, and she was like, wait, we don't use metered dose inhalers quick and fast. And I was like, actually, that's the worst way to use them. You think about a metered dose inhaler or a breath actuated inhaler, there is a forceful spray behind that. And so if the patient then matches that with a forceful inhalation, 
and a quick inhalation, the only place that that medication can go is to the back of the throat. So what we actually want our patients to do is we want them to create a very soft and solid flow across the lungs. So when they start to inhale, we don't even want it to be audible. It should be just like a normal, slow and steady, pressing the canister about one to two seconds after they've started to inhale and then continuing that inhalation process for as long as possible. Now that's different from a dry powdered inhaler where with a dry powdered inhaler, now we have this powder that we have to aerosolize. So with that device, what we actually want our patients to do is take a very deep and steady breath. So they should be audible, but it needs to be steady enough that the patient can inhale for about four to five seconds to ensure that that medication will deposit within the lungs. And then back to that soft mist inhaler, those SMIs, the technique actually should be identical to that of what we would use for the meter dose inhaler. So that very slow, steady, not audible breath for as long as possible. Yeah, I, it's really hard for patients to obviously understand all the technique differences. And I always share that it's not something that I learned in training. So really learning yourself and training yourself is really the first step. And I know in pharmacy school, you get a lot more education about that. But I'm sure you've had a lot of experience teaching other doctors about how to use inhalers. What have you seen? Or terrible. <laughs> yeah. So I obviously I work in a pulmonary clinic and every year I test our fellows. And I can tell you that in 10 years of practice, I can count on one, maybe one and a half hands, how many of our fellows have actually gotten it correct with their inhaler technique. And I, I think that's important because these are pulmonologists. They're trained to be able to educate patients. And here's the thing. There's a lot of different devices and there's a lot of things that you know, physicians have to master. And so then asking them to then get this right and be able to classify these devices the correct way so that they can educate correctly, that's intimidating. And also maybe not something you want to spend your time doing when you have 800 other diagnostic things that you need to do to ensure that you're giving your patient the best care. I think there are some really great tools, though, that you could easily use. The first and foremost, which I know, Leah, we have talked about a lot, there are some really great apps that you can download on your phone that make it easier for you as a physician to just pull out your phone and, hey, let's look at this together as the physician and the patient and make sure that we're doing this correctly. There's also really good resources through like the Asthma Allergy Network, which give you a nice picture form of all the different device types and explain whether it's a meter dose inhaler, breath actuated, DPI, and things like that. There is also a new one through the American Lung Association, which is a pretty cool one as well. There are some tools that you can actually use to assess whether or not your patient can use their inhalers correctly. Currently, there's two that we've seen studied. The first one is what we call the Vitalograph Aerosol Inhalation Monitor. And what's nice about this is you can use it both to train your patient the correct breath technique, but also to assess them. And if they're not able to correct that technique after multiple education attempts, then that kind of tells you we need to switch to a different device. The other device that we can use is really only going to help you assess inspiratory effort and whether or not your patient is going to be able to generate enough flow to aerosolize the product appropriately. And that device is called the in-check dial. Yeah, the app that I love is the COPD Foundation app. They have a list of all of the possible inhalers that you could choose by category and then in the app but also on YouTube they have videos that you can share with patients sometimes I just for fun will watch them myself I think this just highlights how important the interprofessional team is because obviously we'll educate ourselves as much as we can but the role of you as a pharmacist in the clinic or advanced practice providers who are really skilled in teaching patients about device use and things like that it's just so important do you have any idea of what you would recommend for him? In the, in the second part of the case, I chose one, but would you, if he had like arthritis, for example, or cognitive impairment, any ways that you're thinking? I'm actually a big fan of the soft mist inhalers because it is such a nice delivery device for patients that might have advanced COPD. They may lack inspiratory effort. That soft mist really does replicate a nebulizer machine so we can ensure that the patients are getting more deposition into the lungs, it comes back to whether or not the patient can put it together. And so I think, Leah, you made a really great point. If this patient has arthritic hands and isn't able to open the device, put the actual canister in, and then twist it to be able to administer the dose, 
that's a problem, in which case we would probably want to switch them to an alternative agent. I find that not to stereotype, but some of my big barreled chest patients, they will really be great at that deep, steady breath. But then when I ask them to slow it down, they're like, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know how to do that. And so in that patient where I can't get them to do that very slow, not audible, steady breath, then at that point, I'm probably actually going to want to switch to a dry powdered inhaler because I know that dry powdered inhaler is likely going to get better absorption down into the lungs versus the back of the throat, which we would see if the patient was using an SMI or that MDI and they're using that very deep, breathy inhalation technique. So let's continue the case. Perhaps this hospitalization happened at the end of the year. In the rest of the case, I say that Mr. Rivera sends you a my chart message in January. So this is the beginning of the year. On his next refill, you switched him to a Lava Lava, a Lodaterol Teotropium soft mist inhaler. And then he says his out-of-pocket cost is $450. He chose a Medicare Part D plan during open enrollment years ago before he had any medical problems, and he hasn't changed it since. He chose it based on the lowest premium monthly premium, but it has a high deductible. So he asks you if you have any advice for him. I'm the medical director of our clinic. I see this every January and I get a lot of questions. Like, I don't understand why are the costs so high? Where are we getting so many medication rejection messages from pharmacists? Can you explain what's happening here? Yeah. So this is Medicare in a nutshell. We have kind of three parts of Medicare that really cause problems for us as providers. So the first is January when the Medicare cycle restarts. And if a patient has a deductible, that deductible will be due in January, which means when they go to pick up their high cost drugs, typically brand name drugs, they will be responsible for paying that deductible before they are able to get whatever their insurance pricing is. And so I would bet money that this patient is definitely in that initial coverage phase. And because of that is now responsible for this high deductible before his insurance will cover the cost of that drug for him. And then the problem is, is that I remember I said there's stages. So then he's going to get into a stage where he's going to be great and maybe he'll be able to afford it. Maybe he won't. I suspect that he's probably going to struggle if he picked an insurance plan based on the lowest premium, because oftentimes the lowest premium means the highest out-of-pocket costs for our patients. So he'll be in what we consider like the coverage phase where maybe he only has to pay $45 for that brand name and healer. Or maybe he has what we would call a co-insurance where he's responsible for 20 or 30 percent of the average wholesale price. What happens, though, in a lot of these patients, especially patients who pick their insurance plans based on the lowest premium, is that towards the later part of the year, usually August, September, if they're on a lot of high cost drugs, what's going to end up happening is they're going to enter what we call the coverage gap or that donut hole is what many of you are probably familiar with. And now the costs go up again, and that's because the patient has reached their maximums that the insurance have set in terms of drug costs or other costs. And so now the patient is responsible for a larger share until they can get themselves out of that donut hole and into what we would then call catastrophic coverage. Leah, we have talked about Medicare. You and I are both very passionate about how we all need to understand this better, and we need to be able to better educate our patients on this so that they can make better informed decisions. But It's such a hard thing, especially in the pulmonary world, because we have so few generics that we can rely on. And so I think more so than a lot of other disease states and organ systems, we see a lot of issues with the Medicare plan coverages because we don't have those generics to fall back on to provide our patients with different options. Yeah. And so much changes year to year. This year in 2024, there are good changes. So the Inflation Reduction Act that was passed in 2022 is starting to lower some Part D costs. I think it's eliminating the cost sharing for drugs in the catastrophic phase of coverage. So I think functionally the cap is going to be like $3,300. And then 2025, the cap will be $2,000. So that will definitely help. But just like you said, I think planning for January is so important. And then the formulary change where the inhaler that they were on the previous year may not be the preferred inhaler. That's so hard and so disruptive for patients. Well, and and to add to your point, this year, that disruption was even worse because in late December, we find out that Flovent is no longer going to be available, but then all these formularies 
for 2024 in January said, oh, but Flobet is our preferred inhaled corticosteroid. But wait, it's not available. So then what do we do? And that, at least in my clinic, required a lot of prior authorizations because then we had to figure out what was actually going to be covered or wait for them to come out with new formularies. So I agree. The formularies are difficult. Understanding Medicare Part D as a collective whole is difficult. I do agree with you. I think some of the Inflation Reduction Act is going to make a big difference. And I think overall, when we think about the Affordable Care Act, one of the goals was that it was going to shrink down that donut hole, that coverage gap. And it slowly but surely has. And we've seen legislation about insulin and things like that. But we still have a long way to go before we make a difference in our pulmonary patients. So do you have tips? This medication could easily be out of formulary and his out-of-pocket cost is just high because he hasn't reached his deductible yet. But is there any way to, when you send it to a pharmacy, know for sure it's going to be on the formulary? Or do you, are you counseling people in advance? Like it's going to be expensive or what do you, how do you navigate that? Yeah, it's a really hard thing to navigate. And so I think one of the things is trying to just be aware of what resources are available to you. There are a couple of different websites like Cover My Meds, Rx websites that will give you an idea of what the formularies are. But the problem is, is they're never 100% accurate because formularies change. And one Blue Cross Blue Shield insurance card, depending on which patient it's going to, may have five different formularies. But that being said, I think the first thing is educating your patients. And I think you brought up a good point, like talking to the patients and saying, hey, these medications can be expensive. Don't hesitate to call me or call the clinic Mm -hmm if it is expensive so that we can then intervene on your behalf. I think that's number one. Number two is being willing to try to see if there are drug assistance programs through the manufacturer. Something like teatrobium oladaterol, it's still brand name only. And as such, there is federal legislation that even for your Medicare patients requires some patient assistance while in the coverage gap. It only works while they're in the coverage gap for Medicare Part D, but if they are there, you could potentially get that patient free drug from the manufacturer for the rest of the year, which is a big win. And it's something that we have historically done in my clinic successfully for a very long time. I'm not always the biggest fan of things like GoodRx or like shopping around. But if your hands are tied, you have to do the best that you can with potentially using GoodRx or, you know, some equivalent to that website to be able to say, hey, Your insurance is going to be $400, but if you pay cash price at this Walgreens with this coupon, it's only $120. And sometimes that is enough for a patient to make a difference. The last thing that I will make a nod to, which I don't blanket say that we should do for our patients, but the last thing is there's always nebulized solutions. Now, here's the tricky thing with nebulized solutions. You have to determine whether or not they're covered by Medicare Part D versus Medicare Part B, so the medical side of Medicare. With these, the patient often has a 20% coinsurance, which is oftentimes much cheaper than that deductible or whatever they're required to pay in the the, um, donut hole. However, that doesn't always apply for our long-acting antimuscarinics, those LAMAs or those LABAs, because they're brand name only. And so sometimes there's a Medicare B versus D, So at your very worst, you got to get your patients something. There is always the alternative of putting them on short-acting beta agonists and short-acting antimuscarinics, so like ipatropium, but then scheduling it so that it's used around the clock like it's a long-acting agent. Not perfect, but when you're desperate, you got to kind of have your workaround. So it's an option. It's not the best option, and I would reserve it only in your patients where you're desperate to do something. Thank you so much for reviewing this. And there's always so much to learn. The last thing I always encourage people to do is review their Part D plan every fall during open enrollment. And there's a really good website called Medicare Plan Compare where you can put in your medications and see what the best plan is for you. There are programs in my area, and I think it might be federal, but I'm not 100% sure. There's a, a health insurance counseling and advocacy program where you can meet with somebody like a counselor to help you pick a good plan. Do you have that in your Yeah, area? I think it's a statewide yeah. requirement. So yeah, they're great resources for patients. 
Well, Amber, I could talk to you all day about this, but we have to wrap up. Any key points that you want to leave our listeners with or resources they should check out? I I think I would just belabor the point that I always belabor, which is if you don't feel comfortable using inhalers, how can you expect your patients to do it? So please educate yourself so that you can then educate your patients and make a world of difference. Love it. And I feel the same way about understanding Medicare. I mean, COPD is a mostly a chronic disease of people who are on Medicare, mostly. There are some exceptions, but I think it's so important to understand the basics of Medicare Part D so you can talk to patients about why their costs are what they are and help brainstorm with them about reducing costs. Thank you so much again, Amber. Today, we've talked to Dr. Murti Rasef about inhaler choice and barriers to use, including high cost of care, my secret favorite topic in medicine. Nothing more I love than nerding out on Medicare Part D. Thank you so much for joining us. Take a moment to download the Medscape app to listen and subscribe to this podcast series on COPD. This is Dr. Leah Witt for the Medscape in Discussion Chronic Obstructive Pulmonary Disease Podcast. Thanks for listening to Medscape's In Discussion Chronic Obstructive Pulmonary Disease Podcast series with our host, Dr. Leah Witt. Be sure to look for more In Discussion episodes wherever you get your podcasts. Check out Medscape.com or the Medscape app for show notes, links, and more information on chronic obstructive pulmonary disease.